Hey, my name is Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. Uh, I hope that it's encouraging to you and inspiring to you. I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into the scriptures. And I hope that you're able to do that with some people around you, with some community. Um, but if you don't have that, we would love to invite you into the community here at Restore. If you want to take a next step, get more connected, you can just go to restoreaustin.org slash connect, fill out a card on there, and I will personally reach out to you in the days after you do that. And if you want to grab coffee with me or just get more information about the church, I will make myself available to you for that. As you will hear, we are in this thing called a year around the table, and it really comes from this vision that God's given us that Restore would be a place where anyone has a seat at the table and everyone experiences the extravagant love of Jesus. So A, I hope that you experience the extravagant love of Jesus as you check this message out. And B, if you don't have a table to sit at, we want to invite you to Jesus' table here at Restore. Did y'all know that uh, Restore, our church, started out in a denomination? Oh, I'm going to take those blank stares as no. I'm not going to say which denomination in this setting, although it's certainly not a secret, and I'd be happy to tell you if you'd like to know, but when Restore began, we were a denominational church. Now, you can probably tell from the tense of those words that we are no longer a denominational church. And it's important to know that this was not by our choice. We were actually kicked out of a denomination. So I want to tell you the whole story. So when I was in seminary, um, I took a church planting class, kind of interested in starting a church and what that might mean, and there was a denomination that the district supervisor who ran all of Texas and Oklahoma would go to the church planting class and recruit potential church planters because they really wanted to start new churches all over Texas and Oklahoma. So I met this guy and talked through everything with him, told him about Restore, told him what we felt like God had called us to do. Um, We talked about a couple of kind of hot button topics, so to speak, which is that we were going to have um, women in every area of leadership. We were going to be fully inclusive of LGBTQ people and that type of stuff. And um, he was like, well, you'll be the only church in the district that does that. But I guess there's nothing in our policies about not doing that. So it's fine. And so it was like, great. And it was very much pitched as like, we're a big tent movement, you know, we got the kind of core ancient doctrine stuff right, like we come around 2,000 years of Christian orthodoxy, like you can be a part. It's great. So we decided to jump in with them. We jumped in with a bunch of other church networks and individual churches sponsor us and all that kind of stuff. It's just like getting a nonprofit or a business off the ground. You have people that seed into it and then you launch and then we became financially independent about year three, which is kind of the goal. But... On our first year, we did something called BabTQ. I want you to raise your hand if you've ever been to BabTQ at Restore. Yeah, BabTQ is the best. So BabTQ is baptisms and barbecue shoved together. Uh, And so out on the lawn, we do baptisms, and we bring Rudy's Barbecue in for everyone and just have this huge party. It is so much fun. At our very first BabTQ, we baptized eight eight or ten people, I can't remember, and um, one of them um, is this incredible story of this woman named Shauna. And Shauna had come from just horrific background of um, growing up uh, in churches where, um, I mean, Bad, bad news stuff in these churches, like where like black people couldn't come, where they were escorted out, um, where you couldn't even, uh, you know, remotely identify with LGBTQ community stuff. I mean, it was intense kind of fundamentalist churches. And so she grew up, for a number of other reasons too, hating God. And so when we met, she was still very anti um, when we met. I remember we went to coffee at radio and she was like, I don't believe any of this. You need to know that, number one. And I was like, great, cool, cool, awesome. Um, But we became really good friends. She's actually one of my very best friends to this day. And uh, soon after those conversations led into her saying, I I think I want to follow Jesus. She had this incredible encounter with him. We actually showed her story once on on video. It's, It's really beautiful. So we baptized her with all the other people that got baptized at the BaptiQ. And um, now here's something I didn't mention about Shauna. Shauna's a lesbian. Um, And I honestly didn't think that much about it (laughs) when it happened. Um, But there were some other churches in the denomination who got really upset. And they got so upset that they actually took it to the guy that had recruited me. And he said, well, no, we knew that this was, the church was going to be like this. You know, we're okay with it, whatever. Well, they, you know, couldn't get what they wanted done with him. And so they took it all the way to the head of the denomination internationally. It's based out of kind of the Midwest. And they opened to this huge investigation. Over a period of years, we went through an investigation. Our, our leadership team, me specifically, had to give testimony a number of times, all of these different things. And it basically came down to the fact that, well, there was nothing in the bylaws of the district against this. And so the denomination basically ordered the district to rewrite their bylaws so that there was something against it. And then they came to us and said, you have to sign these bylaws. And we said, absolutely not. And um, they said, well, then you're out. 
And so they kicked us out. This was summer of 20, or excuse me, March of 2019 when we were officially kicked out. But it wasn't just that. The denomination actually stripped me of my ordination. I had to mail my ministry license back. <laughs> I wanted to shred it and mail it back. Amy said I couldn't do that. My wife, she said I wasn't allowed to do that. <laughs> and then I got an email from the executive director of theology for the entire international denomination in which he said, quote, I am concerned for your salvation and the salvation of those to whom you minister. Now, I wish I could tell you this is the only time that something like this has happened due to our support of full inclusion for the LGBTQ plus, plus community, but it's not. We've been called an apostate church. We've been kicked out of not just that denomination, but a number of different church networks, even an office space here in Austin we were kicked out of. We lost a bunch of funding over the years, and I've been told I'm going to hell more times than I can count. But honestly, none of that comes close to the joy that we have experienced from seeing LGBTQ plus folks who have come to faith at Restore, come back to faith at Restore, and found a church where they can fully participate for the first time in their lives. The conversations and messages and hugs and tears I've been able to share with people from the queer community make all of the hate totally worth it. Now I also know that what we've been through is nothing compared to what LGBTQ plus folks have endured. The queer community has been called abominations, disowned by their families, condemned to hell, and even tortured and abused through conversion therapy, all at the hands of Christians. And these are not just statistics, these are stories. And these stories didn't just happen to random people, they happened to people that I love. People in this room. People I consider to be my closest friends. One of these friends was locked in a basement and repeatedly assaulted during her Christian conversion therapy. One of my friends was kicked out of a church during their transition, and the pastor told everyone in the congregation to, quote, treat him like he's dead until he repents of his perversion. Another one of my friends came out to her parents, and the first words out of her dad's mouth were, you've ruined our family and brought the wrath of God upon us. But do you know what I find most incredible about these folks? Is that somehow... Through it all, they have not given up on Jesus. The faith of LGBTQ plus Christians astounds and inspires me. Just last year, I met a gay man who's been pastoring for over 25 years. He grew up in fundamentalist churches. He was actually a student at Bob Jones University, which is one of the most prominent Christian colleges in America. He was there at the time when Bob Jones' president marched in Washington, D.C. to oppose civil rights being given to LGBTQ people and said in his speech in front of the White House, quote, I guarantee it would solve the problem post-haste if homosexuals were stoned. This gay pastor has experienced more hate than I can imagine, and yet still follows Jesus with everything he has, including dedicating his whole professional life to the church. And when I asked, how do you keep going? How do you like faithfully persevere through all of this junk? He said, I'm not going to let anybody take Jesus from me. I'm not going to let anybody take Jesus from me. For far too long, Christians and churches have tried to take Jesus from LGBTQ plus people. They have been marginalized, excluded, and even attacked in the name of Christ. And that's why we are spending this morning talking about homophobia and transphobia in the church. And we're in the middle of this teaching series called All Inclusive, God's Big Beautiful Family. And we've been looking at these stories from the life of Jesus and the early church of how God radically included people in his family who had previously been excluded or marginalized. Now, I usually spend about a week writing a sermon. I've been writing this one for two months. I've been preparing for it for what feels like a decade. I've spent more time on it than any other sermon I've ever preached. It's not even close. Because you see, I come from churches where queer people were called evil and abominations and every slur you can imagine. I've ignorantly participated in marginalization and exclusion of LGBTQ plus folks, and for that, I am deeply, deeply sorry. But about 10 years ago, things started to shift. And they started to shift because I met a few gay people who were faithfully following Jesus, and they didn't conform to any of the stereotypes, the things I'd been told about what they were like, right? 
And this caused me to start kind of digging deep into Scripture and reading widely from a variety of perspectives. And since then, I've read about 20 books on the subject, as well as countless kind of articles and sermons. And today, I'm just going to share some of that journey with you as we look at Scripture to help us understand how God sees sexual and gender minorities. We'll also talk about the handful of verses commonly used to justify excluding or marginalizing LGBTQ plus folks in the church. Now, my guess is that this message is going to make some people a little uncomfortable, maybe even displeased, and I understand that. But here's my request. I'm going to pray in just a second. As I do, I want you to ask God to open your heart, to give you an open mind as we walk through this together. And I also want you to know that I'm going to stick around here right after we finish today. I'm going to be giving away these books like I have for the rest of the series. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have right now or schedule a time to go get coffee, Zoom, something like that. I'm an open book. I'm happy to talk to you about this. Now, we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning, which means today's message is a little longer than usual. So we're not going to have a song at the end. I'm also going to put a bunch of notes on the screen. So feel free to write stuff down. Or I'm actually happy to send you the full manuscript of the message today later if you want. You can text me or email me. I'll send you the whole thing. Sound good? Okay, let's pray and dive in. God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your church. We thank you for your scriptures. I pray that as we dive into your word, that you would illuminate it for us. That you would open our hearts, open our minds to the truth that you have for us this morning. I pray that the words that come from my mouth would be inspired by you, God. You would lead us as a church family to who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, I'm a big believer in common language helping to facilitate discussion, so we're going to start by defining some terms. These are from Merriam-Webster. Heterosexual, a person who is sexually or romantically attracted to people of the opposite sex. And then cisgender, a person whose gender identity corresponds with the sex that person had or was identified as having at birth. So heterosexual and cisgender people, sometimes called cishet for short, make up most of the population. I am cishet. And cishet people are the sexual and gender majority in the world. Now, there are also a few terms used to describe people who are not cishet. LGBTQ+, or LGBTQIA+. There's actually some kind of controversy inside of the community about whether to include IA, so I'm going to just use LGBTQ+, for the remainder of the message. Um, queer or sexual and gender minority. These are all terms used to describe people who are not heterosexual or cisgender. Now, most of us know what it means, generally, to be gay, lesbian, or bisexual, but there's a lot more confusion, right, about what being transgender or intersex means. And we see this, like, a lot right now, right? It's playing itself out in public discourse and in politics, where trans people are constantly being weaponized for political gain. So because of the complexity and the prevalence of this conversation, I'm actually going to spend a few minutes right now talking about sex and gender. So the first thing that you need to know is that biological sex is not a binary. Biological sex is not a binary. Now, that is not a political statement. That is a scientific one. You see, biologically, there are three major categories of sex, male, female, and intersex. Intersex is an umbrella term used to describe a variety of variations that affect genitals, hormones, chromosomes, or reproductive organs. Now, sometimes these characteristics are visible at birth, Sometimes they appear at puberty, and sometimes they are not physically apparent at all. Now, biological males and females make up the majority of people, but intersex folks do account for a significant percentage of the population. Now, studies are, like, way all over the place on this. Some saying intersex people make up as little as 0.02% of the population, others as many as 4% of the population. But the American Journal of Human Biology estimates that 1.7% of the population would fit under the umbrella term intersex, which is roughly the same number of people who have red hair, 1.7%. From both a biological and linguistic perspective, sex and gender are not the same thing. You see, sex is rooted in the things I listed above, genitals, hormones, chromosomes, reproductive organs, secondary characteristics, which usually develop during pu puberty. But while gender is influenced by physiology and brain structure, it is impacted by and expressed according to social and cultural patterns, meaning what characteristics define masculinity or femininity vary significantly, depending on time and place and context. We all intuitively understand this. We see it all the time, right? Masculinity in Paris might look like wearing high heels, but in the Deep South, it might look like wearing cowboy boots. Femininity in some African communities means fixing the roof of your cottage, but in Austin it might mean meal prepping for your family. 
My favorite modern example of this is pastors preaching about the decline of biblical masculinity while wearing tight leather pants and earrings that they would not have been caught dead in a year ago or decade ago because that outfit would have been considered feminine. But now things have changed, and so they're comfortable wearing it, still preaching the same message, unfortunately. Now, the degree to which gender is or should be influenced by someone's sex at birth is debated. And the degree to which gender should be influenced by God's biological design is also debated. But what we do know is that the call for all Christians, regardless of sex or gender, is Christ-likeness, defined by the fruit of the Spirit. It is Christ-likeness, defined by the fruit of the Spirit. Dallas Theological Seminary professor and gender studies expert Dr. Sandra Glahn said it like this on our summer mixtape back in 2020. What God is interested in is fruit of the Spirit. For some, it's going to be the fruit of the Spirit in a female body. For others, it's going to be in a male body. And for others, it's going to be in an intersex body. But it's going to be the fruit of the Spirit no matter what your body is. This is very important. The call to Christ likeness is never gendered in Scripture, right? So there are no verses that say, here's what it means to be a Christ-like male. Here's what it means to be a Christ-like female. And in much the same way, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about being transgender or gender nonconforming. Now, there is one verse that some people try to point to, which is Genesis 127, and it says this, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, but we already know, right, from what I just said, that male and female, he created them, can't mean there are only two biological sexes, because intersex people exist. So why include that phrase in this verse? Well, it's because of hierarchy. See, this verse emphasizes the fact that in God's design, there should be no hierarchy between humans based on anything, but especially not based on biological sex or gender. When the world was created, it was God in charge, humanity under, and then all of creation under that. It was very simply like this. There was no deviation, no hierarchy between humans. So then how do transgender folks fit into all this? Well, first, a definition. Transgender means a person who feels a sense of disconnection between their sex and their gender identity. Now, the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, commonly called the DSM-5, calls this sense of disconnection gender dysphoria. Now, gender dysphoria is a clinically significant distress or impairment related to a strong desire to be of another gender, which may include the desire to change primary and or secondary sex characteristics. Now, there is overwhelming consensus in the medical field that gender dysphoria is real. It's not up for debate. It is like settled science and psychology. And the vast majority of people who identify as transgender, whether they have begun transitioning or not, have gender dysphoria. And they usually begin experiencing it as children. According to a recent study published in the American Medical Association Journal, 73% of transgender women and 78% of transgender men first experience gender dysphoria on or before age seven. On or before age seven. Now, there are plenty of debates around transgender issues, and the questions being asked are important. Things like, is medical transition an ethical treatment for gender dysphoria? And if it is, what age is appropriate? And who decides? if and when it's appropriate. Is that children? Is it parents? Is it doctors? Is it consenting adults? Is it legislatures? Questions like, should trans athletes be allowed to compete in sports with their identifying gender? And if so, what transition steps must be taken before that is okay? Now, answering these questions isn't easy. And like anyone else, I have views that are informed by my faith, but honestly, I've never been a decision maker in any of those situations. So my opinion, it really does not matter that much. Because what we must remember, above all else, is that these questions are more than issues. Transgender people are people, first and foremost. They are made in the image of God and loved by Jesus. See, I often come across two unhelpful and polarized responses when it comes to transgender questions. People who think it's gross and people who think it's glamorous. As someone in relationship with a number of transgender folks and parents of transgender kids, I can tell you it is neither of those things. Gender dysphoria is real. It's not gross or inherently sinful. And dealing with it, whether through transitioning or not, is not glamorous. It is hard, like really hard. So be kind to transgender folks. Listen to them. Learn from them. And also be kind and patient with people struggling to understand this stuff. 
Don't condemn people just because they ask a question, because they voice some confusion. Here are a few pieces of advice I've gotten from trans friends and parents of trans youth that I've been told I can pass along to fellow cisgender people, regardless of how we feel about any of the complex questions we've been talking about. Number one, don't post hot takes about trans people online. Don't do it. Number two, don't go up to trans people and tell them how awesome it is that they're trans. It's not helpful. Don't rush to judge families of trans kids. You have no idea what they are going through. Have compassion on parents who are doing the best that they can for their kids while working through their own struggles and experiencing tremendous external pressure from conflicting places. Number four, don't tokenize or stereotype trans people for the purpose of virtue signaling. Number five, don't share or tolerate disrespectful jokes about trans people. If someone is being a jerk, someone is saying something mean, call it out, confront it. Number six, don't associate LGBTQ plus people with higher rates of things like abuse or pedophilia by calling them groomers or predators or anything like that because it's simply not true, number one. And number two, it leads to violence. It leads to violence. In fact, transgender adults are actually four times as likely to be the victim of violent crime than cisgender people are. And Texas leads the nation in transgender murders. And lastly, do not purposefully misgender people. You are not going to get it right every time. And that is so okay. If you don't know, ask. If you make a mistake, apologize. Do your best, though, to use people's preferred pronouns just like you'd use someone's preferred name. Think about it like this. If you had a friend named Dave, and one day Dave came up to you and he said, hey, I've decided to start going by the name Tim, so could you please start calling me Tim? You wouldn't say, heck no, Dave. Get out of here. And listen, I'm never going to do that, and if I see you trying to write Tim on a name tag, I'm going to come up, I'm going to rip it off of you, I'm going to write Dave in all caps, and I'm going to put it on your chest because you are Dave. I don't care what anyone says. We would never do that, right? Using someone's preferred name and pronouns is not political, it's not theological, it's basic human dignity. And it saves lives, especially for young people. I want you to really listen to this. 1.8 million LGBTQ youth seriously consider suicide each year, and one attempts suicide every 45 seconds. And LGBTQ youth attempt suicide every 45 seconds. Even worse for trans youth. They are two and a half times more likely to attempt suicide than their queer classmates. But here's the really good news. Acceptance from just one adult decreases the risk of LGBTQ youth attempting suicide by 40 percent. One adult, one safe, loving, caring, listening adult cuts suicide rates in almost half. There's nothing remotely Christ-like about treating trans people or anyone in the LGBTQ plus community as anything less than a sibling made in the image of God. And as we'll see in just a minute, that's exactly how Jesus and the first church treated sexual and gender minorities. But before we look at scripture, we need to define our central topic for today, which is homophobia and transphobia. It's a fear of, aversion to, and or discrimination against sexual and gender minorities. Now, this is really important because phobias are not the same as believing something is not God's best. Like, for instance, I can believe Christians should abstain from alcohol without discriminating against people who drink. At their core... Homophobia and transphobia are discrimination against sexual and gender minorities in ways that restrict them from participating in society with the same freedoms as cisgender and heterosexual people have. Now, in Christian spaces, this discrimination plays itself out in a myriad of ways based on a specific church or organization. So sometimes it looks like completely barring LGBTQ plus people from attending at all. Sometimes it's a denial of membership. Other times it's being barred from serving or leading or sacraments like communion, baptism, or marriage. But regardless of where that line is, there is a restriction from full participation because of someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And that is discrimination. Someone can claim that it's God-ordained discrimination, but it is discrimination nonetheless. And here at Restore, we believe that homophobia and transphobia are wrong. 
which is to say that we believe any kind of discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity is wrong. And we don't believe that because it's cool or popular. As I've already said, it's a position so unpopular that it's gotten us kicked out of a bunch of things. But we think LGBTQ plus people should be fully embraced and included in the church because we see it in Scripture, actually. We believe the words and actions of both Jesus and the first church amount to a complete rejection of homophobia and transphobia as well as a complete acceptance of sexual and gender minorities. So let me show you what I mean. We're going to start by looking at the words of Jesus. In Matthew 19, Jesus is asked a question about divorce. Now, some claim divorce was permissible by the husband for any reason, and some said it was only legal in certain situations. Now, remember, it's framed this way because wives could not legally divorce their husbands in this culture. Women couldn't really legally do anything in this culture. And so these questions are being asked to Jesus, and Jesus says this, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, it's better not to marry. This response from the disciples is so chauvinist, right? They're basically like, if I can't divorce my wife any time for any reason, I'm just not even going to get married. It's not even worth it. <laughs> Followers of Jesus, man. But as he often did, Jesus uses their response to make a bigger point. Verse 11 is how he responds. But Jesus said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only to those who it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made that way by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Now Jesus mentions three different kinds of people who his statement about divorce does not apply to, and he uses the word eunuch each time. So what is a eunuch? Well, in the Bible, eunuch is an umbrella term used to describe someone in the sexual and gender minority. So sometimes eunuch refers to people who have been castrated, either voluntarily or against their will. This happened for a variety of reasons. So sometimes people were castrated actually because of a job. People believed in the ancient world that eunuchs had no sex drive. Castrated people had no sex drive, and so they were more trustworthy. And so they would be castrated before going to work in, like, finance or in, like, a house of royalty or something like that. Sometimes it was done as punishment because a young boy did not exhibit enough masculine characteristics by a certain age, and so he would be castrated. And then sometimes it was done voluntarily. Somebody chose to do it to themselves or have it done because there was a disconnect they felt between their sexuality and gender, a condition we now call gender dysphoria. Well, other times in Scripture, eunuch refers more broadly to intersex people, and then still other times, eunuch refers to people who choose to remain celibate for a variety of reasons. But here's what I want us to really understand about this passage, okay? Jesus is acknowledging people outside of the more common cisgender heterosexual constructs, and he's not doing it in a condemning way. He's just saying, eunuchs exist. This is reality. Or to put it another way, Jesus is recognizing sexual and gender minorities. So listen, if you're listening to this, and you're a sexual and gender minority, a member of the LGBTQ plus community, this is such beautiful proof that Jesus sees you. That Jesus talked about you. And that he radically includes you in his family. Because you see, those listening to Jesus in this statement, they would have been reminded of an Old Testament prophecy about eunuchs. Sexual and gender minorities, you see, were one of the most vulnerable populations in the ancient world. And because of that, Scripture says they cried out to God for help. And here is how God responds through the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my house and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. Now notice it doesn't say that God is going to fix these eunuchs. He's going to change these eunuchs. He simply says if they follow him, they will be welcomed into his home and into his eternal family. So listen, if you're someone who is experiencing gender dysphoria or who identifies as non-binary, I want you to really listen to that promise. God says, even when you don't feel like you fit neatly into the category of sons and daughters, he promises to give you a name better than sons 
and daughters. That is unbelievable. That is beautiful. And the promise keeps going. These I will bring into my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. I love that it ends by saying that. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Everyone is welcome. Did you know that's the exact same phrase that Jesus yells out as he flips over the tables of oppression and marginalization in the temple courts just days before he's killed on the cross? My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. That's what he yells out. Because there is room for anyone in God's house. Because there is a seat for everyone at God's table. And because God's family is all inclusive. Now for the first church, this radical inclusion of a sexual and gender minority wasn't just theoretical. It was actually something that they explicitly practiced. So look with me at Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all of the treasury of the Kondike, which means queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Now, Philip, he's one of the main leaders in the first century church. He's told by an angel of the Lord to go meet this person who becomes known as the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, like I said a moment ago, there were lots of reasons that someone became known as a eunuch, but what's most important to understand is that they were in this sexual and gender minority. And because of that, he would not have been allowed to even enter the temple in Jerusalem, much less worship there. Jewish law strictly forbid it. So think about this, y'all. The Ethiopian eunuch travels about 1,500 miles from Ethiopia to worship God in the temple in Jerusalem, only to be turned away, only to be told, no one wants you here, only to be called unclean and defiled and an abomination because of his sexual and gender minority status. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. Think about how he must have felt He travels for weeks in pursuit of this God he's been reading about. And when he arrives, the people representing this God completely shun him. Now, for many of you in the LGBTQ plus community, you don't have to imagine that. You've experienced it firsthand. But even after all that, this man is still reading the Bible on his way home. Isn't that incredible? He's still pursuing God, even though he's been told, you can never be included. So God obviously knows what has happened to the Ethiopian eunuch, and that's why he sends Philip to meet him. Verse 29, the Spirit of God told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot. He heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? This question from the Ethiopian eunuch is one of the most powerful sentences, in my opinion, in all of Scripture. And it is a searing indictment on how the church has so often treated LGBTQ plus people. How can I understand it, he asked. I've traveled 1,500 miles. I've tried to worship in your temple. I've met everyone that I can. I've asked them what it means, but no one will explain it to me. Y'all, I've lost count of the number of LGBTQ plus folks who have asked me if they are allowed to be a part of the family of God, even though they're queer. And after I say, of course, yes, yes, of course you are, I always ask, have you ever asked any other Christians or pastors that question? And do you know what most people say? They say, I've tried to, but no one will talk to me about anything other than how I'm living in sin. How can I understand No one will explain it to me. But like so many sexual and gender minorities I know, the Ethiopian eunuch is undeterred. Even after experiencing bigotry and exclusion, he still wants to be a part of God's family. And so God sends Philip to welcome him with open arms. And at the Ethiopian eunuch's request, Philip climbs into the chariot and begins talking to him about Isaiah, what he was reading. Verse 35 Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. 
And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? What a question. When Philip hears it, I'm sure the first thing that goes through his mind is, a whole lot could stand in the way of you being baptized. Because basically every single thing about the Ethiopian eunuch had historically been used to keep people from being a part of the family of God. His skin color, his occupation, his citizenship, and most of all, his status as a sexual and gender minority. I cannot, I cannot overstate what an important moment this is in the history of the church. Because the real question that's being asked here is who can be included in God's family? Who's allowed in? After all, that's what baptism represents. Full inclusion into both God's family and a church family. It's one thing to read scripture with someone in a chariot. It's another thing to fully include them in the church and in God's family through baptism. Philip could have easily pointed out any of those excluding factors and said, I'm sorry, I can't baptize you. But he doesn't. Verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and Philip baptized him. What an incredible story. That just never gets taught in the church, and it makes me so mad. I think my favorite part is that three different times it says Philip is being, being explicitly directed by God every step of the way. Why? Because he wants to make sure that everyone who reads this understands that the full inclusion of sexual and gender minorities in the family of God is God's idea. Excluding and marginalizing people based on their sexual orientation and gender identity is in direct opposition to God's design for his family and for the local church. I believe that with all of my heart. And that is why we are committed to full inclusion of LGBTQ plus people here at Restore. Now, we've done our best to be clear about this commitment for a long time. We've got statements about it on our website. We talk about it in the welcome video every single week. But let me put it directly so there is absolutely no ambiguity. Here at Restore, LGBTQ plus people are fully loved exactly as they are. And they are fully included in every part of our church family. There are no restrictions based on someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And this is true whether someone is in a relationship or not, whether they are pursuing celibacy or not, whether they have transitioned or not, etc. Now this does not mean that everyone who is a part of the church family interprets scripture the same way. Our goal is not theological or ideological uniformity, but we are completely committed to unity around full inclusion. And that means that if you are here at Restore telling sexual and gender minorities that they aren't fully image bearers of God, or that they aren't welcome in God's family, or that there's some restriction on how they can participate in our church, we're going to have a problem. We have drawn a line at full inclusion of all people. This is who we are because this is who we feel God has called us to be. For 2,000 years, sexual and gender minorities have been doing their best to follow Jesus, and the majority of Christians have been too bigoted to notice. Homophobia and transphobia have caused immeasurable harm to queer folks, but it's also really messed up the church. Because when we exclude people that God specifically tells us to include, we miss out on the gifts and talents that they bring. We miss out on the unique ways in which they bear God's image and fully express the fruit of the Spirit. For far too long, churches and Christians have tried to take Jesus from LGBTQ plus people. And we are committed to making that stop. Now I want to bring us to a close by addressing the main objection to full inclusion of sexual and gender minorities that I've been talking about. Namely, the six verses, three in the Old Testament and three in the New, that seem to prohibit homosexual behavior. Walking through each of those would be a whole other sermon. So I'm going to summarize the two major viewpoints, and I'm going to tell you what I believe. Again, my goal is not to make you think like I think. On this issue, or really any other issue, I am a flawed human being with my own biases like all of you. However, I have spent the last decade 
studying this and reading everything I get my hands on about it from people from all over the theological spectrum, and I want to share what I learn, and I want to be open about what I believe. Two major viewpoints when interpreting these six verses. The first is called non-affirming theology. This is the belief simply that Scripture forbids homosexual behavior. Now, even a lot of non-affirming people don't ascribe to the three Old Testament verses. That's because one is about Sodom and Gomorrah, a really bizarre story about a group of men forcing themselves on angels. And the other two are in the Levitical law, which Christians don't abide by, and includes commands like don't eat pork and don't cut your sideburns and don't mix your fabrics and stuff like that. But non-affirming people interpret the three New Testament verses at face value. The most popular of these verses is in Paul's letters to the church in Corinth. He says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I looked at this verse with a lesbian one time. She was like, I'm off the hook. A non-affirming theology looks at a verse like this, and it says, very simply, this is a list of bad things that we aren't supposed to do. Homosexuality is on this list, and so homosexuality must be a bad thing that we're not supposed to do, which makes sense. And it's the way that this passage has been historically and traditionally interpreted. It's also worth pointing out that there are some LGBTQ plus people who hold non-affirming theology and choose to practice celibacy because they believe that that's God's best for them. And as you can probably guess, the opposite of non-affirming theology is affirming theology. This is simply the belief that Scripture does not forbid homosexual behavior. The foundation belief, the foundational belief of affirming theology is that the homosexuality forbidden in Scripture is not the same thing as the loving, equitable, same-sex relationships we see today. Instead, the homosexuality that Paul was talking about is about power and abuse and unrestrained lust. Because in the patriarchal culture of the first century, men had all the power. That's why it says, men who have sex with other men or practice homosexuality. So these patriarchal men, right, they could have sex with their wives, male and female prostitutes, even male and female slaves without any ramifications. There were also pagan temples, like the Temple of Aphrodite in the city of Corinth where Paul wrote that letter, that were famous for encouraging sex as a form of worship. These temples often kept both adults and children as sex slaves. So affirming theology claims those things are what Scripture is condemning. They argue that monogamous same-sex relationships, they didn't exist in the biblical world, and that's historically accurate. Even most non-affirming scholars would concede that point, but they would still argue homosexuality of any type is still forbidden. Affirming theology also points to the fact that the word homosexuality did not appear in the English translation of any Bible until 1946. Because that year, for the first time, the committee translating the Revised Standard Edition made the decision to combine two Greek words into the English word homosexuality in that passage from 1 Corinthians we just looked at. Previously, it had been translated things like abusers of themselves with mankind or even effeminate. Now, not long after the Bible was published, a letter was sent to the RSV committee disputing this translation of 1 Corinthians 6. And Dr. Luther Weigel, the head of the committee, he wrote a letter back acknowledging their mistake and committing to correct the error. But homosexuality wasn't officially changed to the more accurate sexual perversions until the next revision, 1971. And after 25 years, a lot of damage was done. Homosexuality had been picked up by other translation and applied to other New Testament verses, too. Now, if you want to learn more about this, there's an upcoming documentary called 1946 that tells this story. Kathy Baldock, who wrote this book, helped with a lot of the research on it. So that's a quick overview of both affirming and non-affirming theology. Now, there was a time in my life when I found the non-affirming arguments to be convincing, but that is no longer the case. To be very honest with you all, I'm not exactly sure when it happened. It wasn't like a switch that flipped. It was more like a dam that slowly developed cracks until the whole thing gave way. See, the cracks started forming when I met LGBTQ plus folks who deeply loved and pursued God. Then the cracks got bigger when I met queer Christians who had suffered through the horrors of conversion therapy but still followed Jesus. And they got even bigger when I met people right here at Restore 
who'd been kicked out of churches because of their sexual orientation and gender identity, and yet they still wanted to be a part of a church family. And then, when I began to dig deeply into Scripture, the dam burst. And I began to apply the same exegetical and interpretive approach to the six passages about homosexuality that I do with everything else in Scripture. I began asking questions about context and culture and language. And when I did, I came to the conclusion that the homosexuality being forbidden in the Bible bears no resemblance to the loving, monogamous, spirit-filled, same-sex relationships of my queer siblings. I do not believe that same-sex relationships are inherently sinful. Now, they can be but in the same way a heterosexual relationship can be. When there isn't respect or equality or Christ-centered love in the middle of it, so I believe that God desires for any relationship, heterosexual or homosexual, to be covenantal and monogamous. I think that's his best for us. And let me add a quick but important side note. I don't believe heterosexual or homosexual marriage is a necessary part of life. Singleness is good and it is beautiful. And single people are not incomplete. They do not reflect any less of God's image or fulfill any less of God's mission without a spouse or a partner. Okay, back to sexual and gender minorities. I really like the way David Gushy says it in this book called Changing Our Mind. He says, if what we're talking about is blessing and anything goes ethic in a morally libertine culture, I stand utterly opposed, as I have throughout my entire career. But if what we're talking about is carving out space for serious, committed Christians who happen to be gay or lesbian to participate in society as equals, in church as kin, and in the blessings and demands of covenant on the same terms as everyone else, I now think that has nothing to do with the cultural, ecclesial, and moral decline and everything to do with treating people the way Christ did. I don't believe any of what I just said in spite of Jesus and Scripture. I believe it because of them. And I believe it because of the rotten fruit I've seen come out of marginalizing and excluding the queer community. And I believe it because of the Christ-like fruit I've seen come from empowering LGBTQ folks to follow Jesus with their whole selves. Again, I'm not trying to get you to come to the same conclusions that I have. You can interpret Scripture, actually, in a more traditional or non-affirming way and still be fully inclusive. We actually do this all the time. The best example is with divorce. See, the Bible talks a lot about divorce, including the very direct words from Jesus we read earlier. But Christians are far from unified about when it's okay and when it's not. In fact, I bet if you asked everyone here their perspective on divorce, you would get as many opinions as there are people. And yet, we do not feel the need to force our opinion on others. And we certainly don't feel the need to exclude or marginalize someone who's been divorced, even in a way that might confuse us. In the same way, Interpreting the Bible in a way that leads to non-affirming theology is not inherently homophobic or transphobic. I'm going to say this again. This is very important. In the same way, interpreting the Bible in a way that leads to non-affirming theology is not inherently homophobic or transphobic, but forcing LGBTQ plus people to adhere to a non-affirming theology in order to fully participate in the life of the church is. Does that make sense? You nod with me? Okay. Thanks for clapping, that's nice. <laughs> and that is why we are fully committed to full inclusion. We join with God and the first church in the rejection of discrimination against sexual and gender minorities and the full inclusion of LGBTQ plus folks in both God's family and in our family here at Restore. So I'm gonna close with a message I got this week from a gay member of our church. It's a beautiful example of what that Christ-like fruit looks like that comes from celebrating, embracing, including our LGBTQ plus siblings. This is shared with permission. He said, my mind seriously couldn't comprehend a world where I could be gay and a part of a religious community. I had shut myself off from even entertaining it as a possibility. But God's love finds a way through, and I was able to find my way back to him through your demonstration of his love. I found he never left and was simply patiently waiting for me the whole time. The love I received at Restore is why I'm able to share that same love with others. Your love is baffling. God's love is baffling. And my motto lately is that I want to love in a way that baffles. Stories like that are why we are so committed to this hard but important 
work. And we believe it's how Jesus has confirmed again and again that this is what he has asked us to do and who he has asked us to be. I'm going to pray. We're going to be done. Lord God, as Joe said, you are good, you are holy, and you see us as your beloved children with whom you are well pleased. We are so grateful for that. I'm also grateful for these stories in Scripture, for your words through the mouth of Jesus, for your words through the prophet Isaiah, and for your specific direction of Philip to fully include sexual and gender minorities, not in just your family, but in the local church, the first church, so there wouldn't be any question about this. Thank you for your clarity. Thank you for your grace and your hope and your love. I pray that we would do everything that we can to step in and live in to who you've called us to be, both as individuals and as our church family here at Restore. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> hey, y'all are going to make me cry. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for going long. Sorry to all the kids. <laughs>